Great. Um, thank you very much, Professor Robertson, for uh, chairing our panel and opening our discussion about the role of NGO. Um, I'm, I feel really, really honored to be here to share a really local project that's been running for 10 years with this distinguished audience. My name is Xiang, and I'm the co-founder of Clover Youth. We're based in Guangzhou, China, which is the third largest city in the country. So um, our story, it's about how a student initiative can go. And uh, in 2009, my friends and I were graduating from high school, and we were thinking about what we can do for our long summer. So we look around in our city, and we found that you know the buildings back there, the high risers, are the ones that you're familiar with the Chinese cities of the burgeoning economy and development and urbanization. But then there are also like shanty town looking like neighborhoods that have become migrant enclaves. And there are migrant workers and their families and children living in those neighborhoods. So we started to think about what we can do with children of the migrant workers. So we were 18 years old back then and um, Practically, we didn't know anything about the whys and hows of the social problem. Um, it simply didn't feel quite right that the tens of thousands of migrant workers they literally helped build our city, and yet their children couldn't go to public schools, couldn't end up in public high schools, and it just didn't feel right. So what we ended up doing is that we decided that we would do some team-based activities uh, to enrich their summers, and that was our first summer camp in 2009 with 36 migrant children. And um, at the last day, the students asked us, would you come back next year? We said, yeah, sure, why not? We did keep our promises, but what we didn't know is that we're up against a big social problem in the country, which is really, really in institutional. So, Let's rewind back 60 years ago, before, before the reform and opening up. China has set up the household registration system and other institutions to make sure that the farmers stay in the countryside and people stay where they were born. So I guess Chairman Mao and the other leaders didn't anticipate that six decades later, one in every six Chinese are actually migrants. So these localized public service provision, they're not really geared towards people moving around. So what ended up happening is that migrant children um, ended up being in a vulnerable state. And in fact, um, um, UNICEF already identified the children affected by migration as one of the priority areas in China. So children who either migrate with their parents, they often cannot access the essential health, education, and other social benefits in their migration destinations. While with the ch children who left behind with their parents moving away and to find jobs, they're actually more vulnerable to injuries and neglect. So overall, the children affected by migration may face greater risk of violence, trafficking, and labor exploitation. Wow, the process of learning that social problem was actually really, really disheartening because just like Dr. Chen Yudan said in this morning, what actions can actually help with the situation? So what we end up doing is that we find out that Guangzhou is actually in the receiving end of migrant children. So um, according to the statistics um, in Guangzhou, there are about 600,000 migrant children alone in the primary and middle schools in our city. And that's about 44% of the total student population. They're clearly not a minority, but they're still discriminated institutionally and socially. So what can we do? Um, after we registered Clover Youth as an official nonprofit organization in 2012, we spent about three years redesigning our programs. While kids were happy in the summer school and they make friends and that's all good, but not good enough. So what we really want to do is that our program to help them build the confidence and skills so that they can pursue a fulfilling life wherever they go. Um, at the same time, actually, we need to find out some learning activities that student volunteers can facilitate because in today's China, you can actually have really, really good summer camps and other activities, but they're, they have a really high price tag and migrant parents cannot afford them. So we really want to utilize student volunteers and, and train them as facilitators to do our projects. And then finally, we also need to find something that we can get support from the parents, from the teachers, from the school administrators, and very importantly, individual donors. Because um, last year, 52% uh, of our income are from 
individual donors. So um, for migrant children who are aged between um, about 10 to 13 years old, we organize weekend and summer camps focusing on exploring the city. So the idea is not to get a tourist bus and send migrant children around to the city to visit the historical sites and whatnot, but actually we would give them maps, both paper and digital, to ask them to design their roadmaps to travel to certain places, and they will have to complete some team-based challenges so that they also practice their interpersonal skills in the process. And then for children who are a little older, um, we need, they need to think about what they do after middle school. So we organize workshops and summer camps with some practical information about their choices after the middle school. And we take them to visit the local universities, vocational schools, and company. So for the interest of time, I cannot go into the details of our project, but we did use um, interviews, observations, and some adaptive psychometrics to measure um, the outcome of our projects. So over the years, well, we've managed to serve about 5,000 migrant children in the city and mobilized about 2,000 volunteers, and we covered about 15% uh, migrant neighborhoods locally. And, but there's actually a limit to how this model can go. So we actually think that instead of just delivering service ourselves, we need to think about our impact in a broader perspective. So what we end up doing is that uh, we make sure that students, they come back to become our volunteers, so that um, actually the the student over there uh, wearing our t-shirts, they were students in 2009 and 2010, and now they finished their high school and actually become our volunteers. And we also make sure that we share our knowledge. So we managed to get um, our ethnographic observations and some of our uh, local policy analysis into some of the books about migrant children's issues in the country as a whole. And uh, last year, we also started organizing some um, photography weekends for children who are from local families. So we find it is as important to make local families to aware of their city as to serve the children themselves. So um, that's the story of Clover Youth. Thank you very much. You can find us anywhere or catch me during the break. And thank you very much. And I look forward to our discussion.